am reading from a book called Resurrection, the chapter dealing with the dual nature of consciousness. This was written by Neville Goddard. A clear concept of the dual nature of man's consciousness must be the basis of all true prayer. Consciousness includes a subconscious as well as a conscious part. The infinitely greater part of consciousness lies below the sphere of objective consciousness. The subconscious is the most important part of consciousness. It is the cause of voluntary action. The subconscious is what a man is. The conscious is what a man knows. I and my father are one, but my father is greater than I. The conscious and subconscious are one, but the subconscious is greater than the conscious. I of myself can do nothing. The Father within me, he doeth the work. I, objective consciousness of myself, can do nothing. The Father, the subconscious, he doeth the work. The subconscious is that in which everything is known, in which everything is possible, to which everything goes, from which everything comes, which belongs to all, to which all have access. What we are conscious of is constructed out of what we are not conscious of. Not only do our subjective assumptions influence our behavior, but they also fashion the pattern of our objective existence. They alone have the power to say, let us make man objective manifestation in our image after our likeness. The whole of creation is asleep within the deep of man and is awakened to objective existence by his subconscious assumptions. Within that blankness we call sleep, there is a consciousness in unsleeping vigilance. And while the body sleeps, this unsleeping being releases from the treasure house of eternity the subconscious assumptions of man. Prayer is the key that unlocks the infinite storehouse. Prove me now herewith, said the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive. Prayer modifies or completely changes our subconscious assumptions, and a change of assumption is a change of expressions. The conscious mind reasons inductively from observation, experience, and education. It therefore finds it difficult to believe what the five senses and inductive reason deny. The subconscious reasons deductively and is never concerned with the truth or the falsity of the premise, but proceeds on the assumption of the correctness of the premise and objectifies results which are consistent with the premise. This distinction must be clearly seen by all who would master the art of prayer. No two grasp of the science of prayer can be really obtained until the laws governing the dual nature of consciousness are understood and the importance of the subconscious realized. Prayer, the art of believing what is denied by the senses, deals almost entirely with the subconscious. Through prayer, the subconscious is suggested into acceptance of the wish fulfilled, and, reasoning deductively, logically unfolds it to its legitimate end. Far greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The subjective mind is the diffused consciousness that animates the world. It is the spirit that giveth, giveth life. In all substance is a single soul, subjective mind. Through all creation runs a one unbroken subjective mind. Thought and feeling fused into beliefs impress modifications upon it. Charge it with a mission, which mission it faithfully executes. The conscious mind originates premises. The subconscious mind unfolds them to their logical ends. Were the subconscious mind not so limited in its initiative power of reasoning, objective man could not be held responsible for his actions in the world. 
Man transmits ideas to the subconscious through his feelings. The subconscious transmits ideas from mind to mind through telepathy. Your unexpressed convictions of others are transmitted to them without their conscious knowledge or consent, and if subconsciously accepted by them will influence their behavior. The only ideas they subconsciously reject are your ideas of them which they could not wish to be true of anyone. Whatever they could wish for others can be believed of them, and by the law of belief which governs subjective reasoning, they are compelled to subjectively accept and therefore objectively express accordingly. The subjective mind is completely controlled by suggestion. Ideals are best suggested when the objective mind is partly subjective, that is, when the objective senses are diminished or held in abeyance. This partly subjective state can best be described as controlled reverie, wherein the mind is passive but capable of functioning with absorption. It is a concentration of attention. There must be no conflict in your mind when you are praying. Turn from what is to what ought to be. Assume the mood of the fulfilled desire, and by the universal law of reversibility, you will realize your desire. Prayers are not successfully made unless there is rapport between the conscious and subconscious mind of the operator. This is done through imagination and faith. By the power of imagination, all men, certainly unimaginative men, are forever casting forth enchantments, and all men, especially unimaginative men, are continually passing under their power. Can we ever be certain that it was not our mother, while darning our socks, who began that subtle change in our minds? If I can unintentionally cast an enchantment over persons, there is no reason to doubt that I am able to cast intentionally a far stronger enchantment. Everything that can be seen, touched, explained, argued over, is to the imaginative man nothing more than a means for he functions by reason of his controlled imagination. In the deep of himself, wherever ideal exists in itself and not in relation to something else. In him there is no need for the restraints of reason, for the only restraint he can obey is the mysterious instinct that teaches him to eliminate all moods other than the mood of fulfilled desire. Imagination and faith are the only faculties of mind needed to create objective conditions. The faith required for the successful operation of the law of consciousness is a purely subjective faith and is obtainable upon the cessation of active opposition on the part of the objective mind of the operator. It depends upon your ability to feel and accept as true what your objective senses deny. Neither the passi passivity of the subject nor his conscious agreement with your suggestion is necessary, for without his consent or knowledge, he can be given a subjective order which he must objectively express. It is a fundamental law of consciousness that by telepathy we can have immediate communion with another.